good evening good afternoon good morning uh, folks um, give one more minute for the more folks to join and then I will start Okay, so um, welcome to the FCIP presentation um, from Fiber Channel Industry Association. Uh, I have with me uh, Mark Dietrich uh, from Brocade, and my name is Rupin Mohan from HPE. Uh, so welcome, Mark. Good morning. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, glad to have you on, on this presentation. Thank you for joining and thank you for being a presenter today. That's uh, my pleasure. Great. So, uh, folks, we have a great agenda for you. Um, in this uh, presentation, we're going to talk about FCIP. We're going to actually go into a little bit of detail uh, around how FCIP can help you with data protection and business continuity. Uh, we'll cover uh, the basics of, you know, what are different types of uh, connectivity options for data replication, what is data replication, uh, we'll go into what FCIP is, um, and, you know, talk about uh, the design considerations for data replication, whether it's uh, synchronous, asynchronous, and, of course, the related terminologies that uh, we use in this industry, RPO, RTO, which is the recovery point objective and recovery time objective. Uh, Mark is definitely going to go into a lot of design considerations and deployment scenarios, um, and then we'll end up the presentation with a nice summary and Q&A. Now, uh, Mark is an expert in this area, and uh, he has uh, spent many years designing these type of, uh, um, you know, BCDR uh, connectivity uh, solutions and architecting these solutions for customers. So he's definitely a, uh, an expert, and he can help you guys understand this technology and also, you know, uh, give you um, uh, in-depth detail. So with that, um, I'll, I'll cover a few slides and then hand it over to Mark. So first of all, uh, I guess the question that people will uh, ask is, you know, who needs the data protection um, and then from what, what type of event situations you need data protection from? Uh, well, you know, folks, you know, uh, we've seen several of those uh, Hurricane, cyclones, um, uh, you know, natural disasters recently in our news, um, uh, including the recent one in Houston. Um, so uh, we see that, uh, you know, uh, we see more these type of uh, natural disasters um, and, uh, and other type of situations where, you know, you find whole cities are out of power for a week or you know natural disasters you know you know things go out of uh, out of uh, out of the picture so we need uh, uh you know to be able to uh, protect our businesses from these type of uh, you know situations now who is immune to this really there's nobody um and uh you know uh, businesses can suffer um severe consequences um if there's a data loss so hence you know um you know you've got to be able to bring your, uh, you know, um, applications up and running, you know, if there's an issue. Now, uh, you know, companies will do this not just to, um, you know, uh, for shareholders and regulatory, but actually customers. You know, if you have a business that's um, digital online and has a lot of IT back-end support and, you know, um, if systems go and your data is, uh, you know, gone for a week, you're pretty much going to lose a huge amount of your customer base as well as a lot of revenue, et cetera. So, so this is not just a, you know something that's not, you know uh, uh, an outlier event that you have to protect against. I think um, we are realizing that a lot of customers have to uh, plan for BCDR uh, just to make sure that they are compliant. Uh, there are several different uh, options, you know, for long distance uh, connectivity between storage in order to provide the BCDR um, capabilities. We are going to talk about, I'm going to give an introduction and talk about uh, three options, and then we're going to go and deep dive in FCIP. So the first option is naturally, you know, to do um, uh, connect your storage, um, you know, using native fiber channel 
um this is this is of course the a very popular option with customers customers who have two sites that are not far apart let's say less than 100 kilometers and uh, you know customers can um connect two different campuses uh or you know across the river they can connect two different sites you know using uh, you know fiber channel you know usually long wave uh, you know sfps and um, and in some cases they can also use dwdm cwdm multiplexing if they are sharing a, a lambda so that's one option uh, typically the synchronous replication between the two storage arrays that's uh, your most typical uh, campus sort of uh, bcdr option uh, option number 3 is the you know very long distance um, you know connection through ip through an ip port on the storage arrays um this is usually outside the metro distance and um you know customers who are doing typically asynchronous uh data replication um you know over long distance what uh, we have seen is that this type of solution also is popular if you have um sort of low bandwidth uh, uh availability between the two sites and also the the the, the delta the change rate the data change rate um on your primary array is not a whole lot and th- this can be a very popular uh option for customers option number 2 which is fiber channel over uh ip fcip we're going to go into more detail here today this is the option that um you know uh, customers can actually use fiber channel protocol but but transfer the data over an ip network so basically fiber channel protocol runs over an ip network this option is uh the option that we're going to talk about today and it's uh, very popular for customers who have to transfer um you know large amount of data over a very long distance so that's sort of the the sweet spot the use case um option 2 and option 3 three typically are deployed uh, as asynchronous replication due to uh the latencies involved um the next slide we go into a little bit of uh, a solution comparison between the three options as you can see you know the 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 latency um that uh, you can get you know you can support for fcip is the highest so usually you can go the furthest the longest distance using fcip um asynchronous fcip uh, option for long distance uh, replication uh um, of course the, the i talked about fiber channel which is usually campus based you know so 100 kilometers or less is very popular um um you can of course extend it a little bit with amplifiers etc um but but still it still remains a campus option um you know uh the cost point as you can see you know you you have to spend a little bit more uh than uh, your standard uh you know uh, ip you know long distance connectivity but you get a lot more um uh you know fcip supports also high availability uh with a lossless failover in order can also support compression and encryption encryption which are again um uh, two of uh, very popular features that customers want especially when they're transmitting their uh, copying the data over over longer distances they want to make sure that their data is uh is secure and uh, and you know and 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 safe so the key takeaway that i want you to get from this slide is that if you are have a situation where your change rate is is pretty high and you are actually um uh you have to transfer a lot of data to be able to copy this data over a long long distance um you know fcip is a fantastic option uh, available to you to use uh for your dr bcdr solution uh, with that mark i'd like to hand it over to you uh so please go ahead Okay, great. Thank you, Ruben. Um well, let's start with uh what is FCIP in terms of a uh, a protocol. It's a tunneling protocol, right? So we're taking fiber channel and we're encapsulating it in IP and we're tunneling it from one tunnel endpoint to another tunnel endpoint. And uh we could connect all types of fiber channel devices right so it could be arrays it could be tape and if it's live mirroring we generally call that rdr which is remote data replication and we could also do tape and it could be open systems tape or fibercon based tape there there's a lot of fibercon based tape uh extension going on out there 
And, and let me mention uh, FCIP, also referred to as extension. Um, it's a common term. Um, so what we're doing is uh, we, we have an ISL, just like any typical fiber channel ISL, and we're encapsulating that uh, through IP. So as far as the the switches on the end, and the switches could be the extension boxes or, or the FCIP boxes, or they could actually be edge fabrics on each side. Uh, that's possible as well. Uh, those are connected via an ISL. It's an FCIP ISL, but it's still an ISL. So a VE port is a virtual E port, and you're really just connecting two E ports uh, across an IP uh, link which means that the control traffic, such as class F traffic, has to pass across that as well. Now, the fiber channel traffic doesn't know that it's going through an IP network, and the IP network doesn't know that a fiber channel SAN is passing through it. Uh, they're kind of referred to as ships in the dark. So here's a graphical representation of what I just talked about. Uh, we have a SAN, and it, it, in this case, it's just one big merge SAN. And you can use fiber channel routing and separate this, and, and that's you know a discussion for another webinar. But in, in this webinar, we're, we're not going to get into fiber channel routing. But the because it they because this is ISL that you are connecting together, it would merge your fabric together at each location. Now all we're doing is taking those ISLs and putting them through IP, which is FCIP. So FCIP is a TCP-based protocol, and there's reasons why we use TCP. Uh, I would have to say that it's, uh, if you were to do a trace, everything would look standard on the trace as far as what uh, TCP is doing. However, these TCP stacks have been greatly modified uh, to be much more efficient and more robust, more heavy duty going across uh, IP networks uh, and WAN connections. And the reason why is we're, we're not doing web pages and email, we're doing storage and we're doing enterprise storage in most cases and enterprises purchase WAN connections that the assumptions for TCP could be different. So we use TCP because it's a reliable transport. We know all the bytes are gonna make it to the other side. They're gonna make it in order. Uh, it's connection oriented, stream oriented. So everything is sent as streams. Uh, it, it, the encapsulation is, is typically not such that uh, it's individual frames, uh, discrete frames, but, but a stream of bytes. Um, it's full duplex, so data can go in both directions. And it, it, at least these TCP stacks can handle very large bandwidth delay products. You know, that would be the amount of latency multiplied by the amount of bandwidth of the link is how many bytes outstanding at any one time. So with these products, that number's a pretty large number. So RPO and RTO. So we have recovery point objective, and recovery point objective is the last um, bit of information that was safely recorded off-site uh, so that if a disaster happened, that's how far back in time uh, you could recover your data, right? That, that's what was recorded last. So if you look on the graphic, we have a disaster, a catastrophe, and the arrow pointing backwards is the last bit of information that was recorded safely off-site. RTO, recovery time objective, is 
how long will it take to get my systems back up and running after the catastrophe strikes? And this is going to vary, right? You know, this is going to vary on things like, um, are you using uh, a service for your backup? You know, let's say Rackspace. You know, that's just an example. And you're copying data, and, and you have to light up all those servers with your data in order to get back online. You know, that's, that's something that these type of uh, data centers do. Or you have another data center, and you have fully equipped it with all the equipment that is necessary to bring your services back up online in, case, in case of a catastrophe. The RTO is going to vary based on, on what you have. Now, if you do extension, you could get, you, you have data that with a very uh, short RPO and re sitting on arrays, remote arrays, ready to go. So your RTO can be very short. That's the nice thing about doing FCIP or extension is you, you get very short RPOs and you could have very short RTOs. If you're going to tape, so that's the, let's say that's the other extreme, your RPOs are going to be much longer because who knows when the tape was, was last done. And now you got to take the tape and you got to put it back on, on systems. And that's going to make your RTO much longer. So, of course, there's going to be a difference in the amount of cost that it takes to do these different technologies. It all depends on your business model, right? If your business model is such that uh, you don't need uh, to record transaction, it's usually transactional databases and stuff like that, up to the very last second, and your, your company will survive and won't suffer huge consequences, then that's fine. But if you're the type of company, let's say a large financial company, and missing a, a lot of transactions is going to be a problem, then you need to do a technology that, that will accommodate your business model. Okay, so extending over the WAN, uh, so the advantages of FCIP, it's an IP WAN, and IP WANs are ubiquitous. Uh, you know, there's IP WANs everywhere. They're generally cost effective, or at least relative to other technologies uh, that involve WANs. Uh, it gets you outside the disaster area, so uh, that's beyond a metro area, because if a metro area becomes a smoking hole, you, you want to be outside that area, right? Um, access to data globally. You know, we have companies in Europe that want to move data to the U.S. and vice versa or to Asia, um, multiple paths and carriers. So uh, if you want to do AT&T and Verizon, for example, so that you have, you know, different pathways and in different uh, organizations managing the WAN links, that, that could provide higher availability. The challenges are, you know, can I do synchronous versus asynchronous? What's the propagation delay? Uh, you know, because that's going to determine what my RPO is. Um, as far as continued operations and, and where I put the data, what do I have in the remote location in order to get my systems up and running again? Uh, you know, what's that going to take? Uh, security. You know, obviously you don't want anybody uh, eavesdropping or copying data or altering data in transit. WAN bandwidth, you know, how much bandwidth am I going to need? Am I going to efficiently utilize the bandwidth? How available is that bandwidth? And then, of course, um, do I have to share that bandwidth with other applications uh, in my enterprise? Generally speaking, for most customers, the answer is yes, you do. So you, you're going to have to, to move your data across WAN links with those other applications 
w without you know causing problems either for the other applications or for your storage. So some attributes uh, that apply to extension. Uh, obviously, performance. Uh, you want to be able to move data as quickly as possible. Uh, the flexibility of, of different IP networks and, and connectivity types, uh, which includes, you know, different uh, latencies, different bandwidths, that type of thing. Uh, resource optimization. You want to do WAN optimization and, and have WAN optimization techniques uh, as, as best you can, right? You, you want to have protocol acceleration uh, if that applies. Uh, and that may apply to FICON, it may apply to uh, tape, it may apply to um, writing from arrays. Compression techniques, security techniques, I, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. The uh, network integrity, so you want to have high availability. You want to recover from errors, so fail over, fail back. Um, protocol. Uh, and, and fabric services isolation. So this would be like fiber channel routing um, and, and your encapsulation, that type of thing. And of course, the architectures that you build, there's some best practices out there on, on how to build the best architectures. So some SCIP technologies, uh, high availability, that involves uh, significant technology built in uh, to these products, uh, compression, uh, things like IPsec uh, for security and encryption, the replication mode. So this is more on the array side. So arrays typically, they, they either operate in a synchronous mode, which I'll explain in, in some other slides, or asynchronous mode. Uh, there's some hybrid modes involved as well, but for the most part, they're either synchronous or asynchronous at any point in time. IP WAN and infrastructure. Um, so this uh, has to do with how you can accommodate uh, latencies and efficiency of using bandwidth and the encapsulation and, and protocol uh, as well and the optimization of those. And QoS. There's uh, a, a wide variety of, of QoS options uh, on these products. Now, uh, fiber channel fabrics and fiber channel routing uh, is grayed out. Uh, there was a previous webinar, uh, which you could find on sc.org, uh, that talks about just doing native fiber channel over long distances and uh, in, in fiber channel routing. So some terminology and concepts, uh, RDR is remote data replication. I mentioned that already. Uh, effective throughput is the throughput as seen by the end devices. So this would be the, the arrays, right? Uh, if you're doing RDR or, or tape devices, if you're doing tape. Um, what is the throughput that, that they see? Um, which will be oftentimes different than the throughput that you see over the WAN. Because if you're getting compression or you're doing IPsec or that type of thing, there will be a difference in the throughput over the WAN compared to what the end devices actually end up seeing. Uh, encapsulation of fiber channel into SCIP is very efficient. Uh, it's an it's an efficient process. Uh, it's a very fast process. It, it's not a lot of overhead. Now, in terms of latency, the latency that is often discussed with extension is the round trip time latency or the propagation delay that is seen by the TCP stack from the entry point of the tunnel to the end point of the tunnel. So you can see on this graphic here that the round trip time is measured from the SCIP boxes, not the end devices. If you're measuring 
from the end devices, that would be your I.O. response time. So synchronous versus asynchronous. So, um, synchronous, the, what should be most understood about synchronous is that if a, if a write is acknowledged to the initiator, it's been safely written locally and remotely. Asynchronous, that's not the case. With asynchronous, the initiator uh, or the host that's generating the, the I.O. Uh, will be responded to immediately from the local um, the local side, the, the, the array on the local side. And it's up to that array on the local side to make the right to the remote side. Uh, and the initiator is out of the loop, essentially, on that. Um, Typically, IP WANs uh, per distance uh, of kilometer is less costly. Um, so you're, you're going to um, uh, essentially dark fiber uh, and Lambda services are going to be expensive uh, over long distances. And we're talking beyond metro distances. The most popular uh, long distance, and we're talking beyond metro, is to use asynchronous FCIP replication. So as far as designing uh, an FCIP network, uh, whether it's a synchronous, asynchronous, or co uh, copy, uh, it depends on what you're trying to do, right? So again, if uh, synchronous would, would be great, we would all want to have synchronous all the time if we could. The problem is, as the distance gets longer, your I.O. response times will get longer as well. Now, asynchronous comes in a couple flavors. Um, there's the ability to keep your write in order, which a lot of applications, uh, that is essential. You have to have that. And, and consistency groups as well, where if you're writing, you have an application that's writing to multiple ones, uh, that those writes stay consistent across the ones. Uh, this is going to require more intelligence in the application, and um, and we call that asynchronous replication. Now, copy is is not quite as intelligent, and what's happening with copy is all the tracks that are updated, uh, we, we call them dirty. Uh, we keep uh, essentially a map of, of the tracks that are dirty, and it's just a process of going through those and, and copying them. They're not copied in any particular order, uh, and there's no concern for consistency groups. It's just a matter of copying them. Uh, this can pose a problem if you need to fail over to the remote side and something has been written in a different order than it actually was generated by the initiator. Uh, it would not be consistent and in some cases your application would fail to come up. So you have to keep that in, in mind as well. Uh, there are different bandwidth requirements for these things um, and, and I'll get in, into that a, in a little bit later. The arrays, you know, how fast can they send data? Um, how fast is it on a per LUN basis? Or how many LUNs are you going to be sending? Um, is it on a fiber channel port basis? How many ports are going to be sending? Uh, how fast is the application? Uh, these are also other things. So, you know, just because an array may have a 16 gig port on it doesn't mean it's going to be sending data out that port at 16 gigs. And the data delta per period of time, uh, what, what this means is as data is changing, um, you know, how much data is changing in a, in a certain period of time. Okay, so what is synchronous? Uh, if you look on this diagram, you see some 
circles with numbers in it. So the initiator is sending out an I.O. It goes uh, into the array. Uh, the array sends it across a fiber channel switch, across some infrastructure, and it it just happened to pick the, the top one, the, the top uh, DWDM connection. It could have just as easily picked the bottom one and uh, goes to the other side. So you see number three, hits the array there, it responds back with an acknowledgement, uh, which is number four, number five, and then number six. So you see that the IO response time requires traversing distance. And there is a limit of the speed of light, and it becomes significant after a certain amount of, of distance. So the longer the distance, the longer IO response times will be. Uh, and the array, the local array, will not respond until it gets an acknowledgement from the remote side, hence the reason why it's synchronous. All rights are guaranteed to be safe. Your RPO is at zero. And fiber channel switches are used in this case mainly to provide the buffer-to-buffer -buffer credits to get you over that distance. Okay, you can use SCIP switches as well in, in a synchronous environment. Uh, essentially what you're getting from the SCIP switch is the ability to do uh, encryption, although uh, fiber channel switches often uh, provide encryption now, or actually the modern ones do provide encryption. Uh, the ability to do trunking or port channeling across multiple pathways So the, the last one for synchronous here is uh, you could go through an IP network. So it's the same as the previous slide, except now you're going through an IP network before the IP network goes across DWDM. This is fully supported, but you have to keep in mind that if the IP network causes the SCIP traffic to have to buffer, or if there's any loss of data in transit and there's retransmissions involved, this will cause your I.O. response times to increase. Uh, and it could be significant because the amount of time in buffers or the additional round trips required for retransmissions would be significant to an I.O. response time. So if you're going to do synchronous through an IP network that is going through some kind of DWDM infrastructure, it should not be oversubscribed, and it should not be possible for congestion to happen on those particular lambdas that you're using. Okay, asynchronous. Now, asynchronous is different. So if you look at the little circles, you see the I.O. come out from the initiator and immediately is responded to by the array. Okay, so now the initiator is not waiting, uh, and it continues on, and, and the users uh, that are using this application are happy, and they're not experiencing any delays. Now it's up to the array to send to the remote array. So you see in red, one, two, three, four. And the uh, R1 array is managing uh, the replication of traffic to the R2 array. So there's going to be a delta, uh, an RPO delta now. And the RPO delta is the difference between when the green circles happen and the red circles completed. And, and this, you know, this is a, a managed amount of, of data loss, uh, essentially. And, and, and hopefully, it, uh, based on uh, the array and how it works uh, and uh, the, you know, how much bandwidth you have and other factors, the, your RPO could be a very short amount. It could be maybe a second or a couple seconds. Uh, you know, it could be longer and, and it varies, again, based on many factors. So bandwidth requirements for these two uh, differs. So synchronous, you have to accommodate the peaks. 
uh, all the bandwidth has to be accommodated. I, I'm, I'm sorry, all the writes have to be accommodated all the time. Uh, otherwise, they end up getting buffered uh, or they end up getting dropped, even worse. And if they get buffered or dropped, like I said before, retransmissions are going to cause additional round trip times. And um, buffering means data is sitting idle in a buffer and it's not moving, which is going to cause delay, right? So uh, now RDRA or asynchronous, uh, you could average out the uh, sending of traffic over time. It doesn't have to all be sent immediately because it's not causing any delay to the initiator. Now, having said that, you're, you're not going to average this out over the whole day. You want to average this out over like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, something like that, because you can't just journal and, and store traffic to be sent at a later time indefinitely. Uh, you, after a certain amount of time, you, it kind of starts to work against you. You, you need to uh, have the data sent within a reasonable amount of time. Okay, so here's some different topologies for replication. Uh, obviously, this is a very simple one where we have an initiator talking to an array, so that would be R1, and then R1 talks to R2 at, at, the, at the remote site. Uh, and in this case, we're doing asynchronous uh, RDR uh, over some distance. Now, an alternative is this cascaded approach where R1 can do a synchronous replication to R2 in a metro area, and that way we have very little latency and we, we don't have a problem with the initiator having to worry about uh, excessive latency. And then that R2 array can, all, can in turn become an R1 array to do asynchronous to a remote site <clears throat> and get outside the, the area of the catastrophe. So why is this important? If, if, if all you're doing is planning on a metropolitan area becoming a smoking hole, it, you, you're still going to have an RPO um, between the metro area and the DR site. But what if what if it's only R1 that experiences the disaster? You know, maybe it's a, a flood and R1 is in the flood area and, and, and R2 is not in the flood area, or a fire and R1 is in the fire area and R2 is not. You, you, you haven't lost any data because there was synchronous going on there. So that's a, that's a consideration. And it, it depends on your company and if you have the resources and multiple data centers. And, and that type of thing. So this is another popular uh, topology. This is the, the 3DC topology. And the primary site here is replicating synchronously to a bunker site. So that would be in a metro area. But it's also replicating asynchronous, asynchronously to the remote DR site. And if we have uh, Either the data center uh, is destroyed or the connectivity from the primary site to the remote site uh, goes out or goes down for some reason. What happens is the bunker site starts an incremental resync and starts to do asynchronous replication to the uh, DR site. And, and, and of course, that works very well uh, in maintaining um, data replication. So is there interoperability between the two vendors? And by the way, the two vendors that are making FCIP equipment is Brocade and Cisco. Uh, simply, there, there's no supported FCIP interoperability uh, between Brocade products and Cisco products. So some FCIP features. And uh, I chose this graphic because I like the idea of these parallel pipes 
uh, and because this is pretty much how uh, things like trunking and port channeling work. So extension trunking and port channels is a way to have multiple connections. Uh, we, we could aggregate them uh, to have aggregated bandwidth, so we have more bandwidth to be able to use. Uh, path availability uh, is greatly enhanced because if, let's say, you're taking one path through a data center, you're going through data center A switch, and the other one's going through data center B switch, and then maybe there are ones going through Verizon and ones going through AT&T, and they're taking completely different paths, you, you don't have any single points of failure by doing this, and, and that greatly increases availability. Uh, you have load sharing, load balancing going on. You have failover and failback uh, going on. So all these things are, uh, are the benefits of, of doing extension trunking or port channeling. Compression. Uh, the products offer uh, various compression algorithms, and the algorithms are usually optimized based on how much bandwidth is going to be used. So they're, they're processor-intensive algorithms, and if you need a lot of bandwidth, you're going to have to have more of a lightweight process, which means you may only get two to one, let's just say. But let's say you're not using a lot of bandwidth. You can use a, a much more heavy-duty compression algorithm, and maybe you could get four to one uh, by using the other algorithm. The trade-off is you can't get as much bandwidth through that algorithm. So that's, that's what's going on here. And obviously, compression will increase your effective throughput, which is the throughput that the end devices see, or it will reduce the amount of WAN bandwidth that you need. Uh, encryption. So encryption, you know, is it a requirement? I know in the healthcare industry, for the most part, it's a requirement. Um, financials, they like to use it, of course. I personally think it's prudent. There's really no reason to not turn on encryption. It, uh, it really has no downside to it. Uh, it's in-flight data only. Right, so you, you're not gonna have any data loss. So, and what I mean by that is, if you were encrypting data at rest and you lost the keys or you couldn't unencrypt it for some reason, that would be data loss. But as far as sending data out across a WAN, uh, yeah, okay, so you could lose data that's going across a WAN, but you're not losing data uh, in terms of, of replication. That's, that's not what data in flight, uh, it, it, that just can't happen. No key manager is required. Um, you can use certificates if you want, if that's a requirement for your business. And um, it's good for those devices that either have a severe penalty when they're doing their own encryption or devices that just can't encrypt on their own. So you, you rely on FCIP to do that encryption of data in flight. So um, it is a best practice uh, it's good to encrypt from the tunnel origin to the destination, which means it would be on the FCIP boxes. Um, doing it in the IP network can certainly be done. It, is it better to do it in the IP network? Generally speaking, no, it's not better. Uh, it will be more costly because when you do it in the IP network, that is not going to be included uh, in, the, in the FCIP product. Uh, and you may take a performance hit instead of running at line rate. So also the storage admins wouldn't be able to turn it on and off, uh, and there might be diagnostics and troubleshooting issues uh, that would be hampered if it was done in the IP network. So here's a graphic, it's a very simple graphic. You have two extension boxes. Everything between box A and box B is encrypted. And as far as in deployment goes, uh, you could do fabric attached or you could do direct attached. 
fabric attached means that uh, your devices are going through uh, your your fiber channel fabric. The fabric is then connected to the extension boxes, and then the extension boxes are going out to the WAN to the remote data center. Direct attach means the devices that are replicating, um, and, and usually on an array, the ports that are doing the replication are dedicated to doing replication. They're not doing anything else. And, that, and there's a good reason for that, right? You, if, you're, if you have hosts going in and out of a port that's doing replication, and the replication is going across a WAN, and let's say the WAN is, you know, uh, let's say you get two gigs uh, you, you've been a portion two gigs of the WAN bandwidth. Your hosts are, are going much faster than than two gigs usually, and uh, you're, you're going to get uh, some um, effects from buffer to buffer credit contention going there because the the port on the array is only going to be able to uh, communicate at two gigs because uh, buffer buffer credits are, are, are being uh, withheld uh, because of the WAN connection, which will hamper the hosts from communicating through that same port. So you don't ever want to put replication and hosts on the same port. That doesn't make any sense. So these are typically dedicated ports, and uh, they could go directly into the SCIP box, which has fiber channel ports on it, and then out onto the WAN. So best practice, direct attach. And there's there's various reasons for this. Of course, a scalable solution is fabric attached and, and, and customers do fabric attach. Don't preclude fabric attach if that's what makes sense for your environment. Uh, it is a much simpler design to do uh, a direct attach. Uh, it's if you have to do firmware updates, it tends to be a completely separate network, so you don't have to worry about the production fabric uh, during the uh, the upgrade and uh, what you plan for a production fabric versus what you plan for a replication fabric uh, tend to be very, very different. So there, there's some of the reasons why uh, uh, it's best practice to do direct attach. The most common deployment looks like this. Um, we have an A and B fabric. So you see uh, the, the top, we'll call the top ones A, we'll call the, the bottom extension boxes B. And tape or storage connects into it. And you see storage uh, typically connects to A and B. So you have A and B controllers, or you have multiple controllers that connect to A fabric and B fabric. Tape tends not to be that way. Tape tends to only have a single path. This is not 100% true all the time, but it's most most common. It is true, and that's why you see just a, a same connection on, on this particular tape. And we have a green trunk, which I call trunk A, and we have a blue trunk, which I call trunk B. And there's two circuits coming out of that trunk, and circuit zero is going to the top WAN router, and circuit one is going to the bottom WAN router. So we have multiple connections uh, that take different pathways. And then when it comes out the other side, they join back together at the same box. So the green is just connecting the two A boxes and the, the blue is just connecting the two B boxes together, even though they're taking different pathways through, through the way. And this is the most common architecture. Okay, um, Ruben? Hey, <laughs> good job there, Mark. So, Mark, why don't we take some of the questions? I think we have three questions uh, on uh, online on the on this platform. So, can you uh, see them, or should I read out to, read read them out to you? Uh, go ahead and read them out. Okay, sure. Uh, so, the first question is, uh, what do you mean by frame based uh, load balancing in F FCIP? Uh, well, okay. Uh, so I, uh, I, I want to be fair to um, 
so there's brocade and there's there's Cisco and there's different ways of doing things. Um, and um, port channels are tend to be a flow based uh, hash, right? So based on uh, source, destination, OX ID, uh, or just uh, source and destination ID, um, you could do a hash of these different flows and and, and send them across. Uh, basically, it, what they'll do is they'll hash out to a particular uh, connection between the SCIP boxes, and, and that way uh, you get a, a flow-based or exchange-based uh, load balancing across uh, the different connections. Uh, Brocade works a little bit different. What Brocade is doing is they're taking um, batches, which is actually multiple frames, uh, batching them together, and then uh, doing a deficit-weighted round robin across the connection uh, in order to assign that batch to, to a connection. And, and that's how um, Brocade does it. So it, it's a different method. And uh, so that that's what I mean by uh, by that. Okay. Um, uh, after the two questions, though, you know, we're gonna we're gonna talk a little, take, do a little bit summary, Mark, before we uh, go cover, you know, go forward. So the the next question, maybe next two questions, we can answer very quickly. Uh, so the second one is, can you port channel between two different types of boxes? I don't know what two different types of boxes means. Um, well, let me let me answer this. Uh, I, I would I would have to believe uh, on the on the Cisco side, and and, and I'm a CCIE, so I I know Cisco pretty well. That uh, uh, as long as uh, you're talking about two boxes that support SCIP. Uh, and uh, the firmware versions are compatible. Um, that it it's possible. It's going to work. Yeah, it would okay. work on bro brocade Great. side. The, it, it's it's very similar. Uh, you you have to have uh, the generation of SCIP connect uh, SCIP boxes that work with each other, along with the firmware versions that that work with each other. And then you can do um, extension trunking between those boxes. Right. right. Great. And the third question is: Can the two WDM paths be different length and still use the same logical ISL aggregation, so that FSPFC is only one single route? Yes. Yeah, so that's a good question. The uh, answer is: If you're doing native fiber channel, um, uh, well. Boy, there's all kinds of scenarios. If you're doing a native fiber channel and you're doing a, a flow-based uh, sorting across the different DWDM connections, uh, they could be different, right? Uh, if you um, are doing uh, a type of trunking, it it's hard to say. Uh, you may not uh, be able to. Uh, they may have to be the same length. Uh, and this depends on on who who you're using uh, for your uh, equipment as well. Now, if you're doing SCIP, um, the bandwidth could be different, the latencies could be different, everything could be different uh, uh, across the different pathways. Uh, and uh, I don't know for sure with uh, with Cisco if that affects SPF, but with Brocade it does not. Uh, with um, with an extension circuit or an extension uh, VE port, the uh, the FSPF costs are fixed, and they're fixed to a very large value, so that FS uh, so that FCIP would not be preferred over any uh, actual native fiber channel connection. And I, I'm sure it's very similar on, on the Cisco. Yeah, side I'm sure too. Well. I'm sure too. Well, you answered that question very well, Mark. So let me summarize this uh, uh, this presentation for folks who uh, may be joined late. Um, so uh, you know, we 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 talked about three different ways of uh, connecting storage arrays over long distance. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, the first is of course uh, you know over fiber channel. 
um, you know, uh, second is over standard IP. Um, and the third option is which we went into a lot of detail today is FCIP. Um, now, uh, there are, you know, when you talk about storage replication, there's synchronous and there's asynchronous replication. We talked about that in detail. With synchronous, uh, you have to have, you have to make sure your, uh, your network uh, uh, sizing is done properly so that your applications don't get uh, slowed down, you know, because of replication. So you have to pretty much, you know, account for the maximum um, you know, uh, I/O requirements. Uh, you know, in terms of uh, uh, bandwidth between the two sites. When it comes to asynchronous, you have you have uh, it's a design choice of several requirements. But again, depending on your RPO and RTO, which were again the two terms we we introduced in this presentation, RPO and RTO. Depending on your business model, depending on your um, uh, customer, um, you can design your um, asynchronous. Um, um, network, you know, and, and again, different designs can result in different RPO and RTO. When it comes to FCIP, uh, if you have to have a, a replication distance, a long distance, and your data change rate is, is quite high, FCIP is a very, um, uh, very um, interesting uh, way to connect two data centers to storage to storage arrays and do replication. Now, uh, Mark mentioned that both Brocade and Cisco have fantastic options. Both vendors have great technologies, and uh, customers can have uh, can do their own due diligence. And depending on their customer, depending on their application, they have uh, great choices between both these vendors. Um, in our presentations from FCIA, um, we always 100% um, strive to be vendor neutral. Sometimes it's hard, but we always try to make sure that when we are presenting, we are 100% vendor neutral. So, um, you know, I think um, depend maybe the the few Q and A questions went into some detail there, but I, I think um, Mark, you you answered them pretty well. That both both vendors have good solutions um, in uh, for both these different options. Um, with that, um, I'm going to just quickly uh, put a plug in for our next FCIA webcast. Uh, fiber channel uh, performance. Uh, we're going to go deep down in that. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, congestion issues, slow drain ports, and of course overutilization sometimes. Uh, this will be on February 6th uh, next year. Please mark your calendars, um, and uh, we would love to see you um, in the next presentation. One, most, one more thing we'd like to request before you guys leave is to please rate this event, and uh, we love your feedback. We value your feedback. Uh, we will post uh, this Q&A blog as well as as well as this um, as well as this recording uh, online. Um, you can follow us at Twitter at FCI News uh, for updates uh, as well as on on future FCI webcasts. And of course, the most important part: we are storing all these uh, webcasts in a library uh, at http um, you know fiberchannel.org slash webcast. And we have done uh, uh, four presentations already. This will be the fifth one. So please go, you know, feel free to go and uh, reference these webcasts and and uh, and watch the replay. With that, Mark, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, present this session. Um, we'd love to have you thank back you. sometime. In the future. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to all the audience members for um, staying with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, bye -bye. everybody. Bye bye. Bye.